They were headliners and they didn't want to have anything to do with the other groups. Boy, they were stuck up. Uh, pause. How the hell is they stuck up when they're around there in the sex labyrinth with the uh, Etta James? love bugs hello there bellas if you have not already done so please remember to like share to facebook or twitter subscribe and visit uptopbeauty.com today's looky lookies would be our renee scarves i'm not sure what number this is we do still have a couple over there and they are on sale for $20. And I know some of you guys are like, nay, I love those glasses. I have just ordered some glasses that are pretty close to these. These are Tom Ford's. These are my uh, wife's glasses. So uh, you know that the price that they are is not going to be the price that I would sell them to you for because I would get something close to an authentic Tom Ford. I wouldn't get you a Tom Ford, but it would still give that look that you're looking for and if you are not already a part of this book club please hit the patreon link below and or the join button here on the youtube and for a small monthly fee of five dollars you babies yes you can be privy to all the shenanigans before the youtube gets it if the youtube gets it now let's continue talking about be My Baby by Ronnie Spector. We had to go down to Miami to be discovered. That's how the universe works, baby. Going to one of Murray the K's rock and roll reviews at the Brooklyn Fox was the highlight of any New York Kids Week in the early 60s. Murray first put us on the bill at the Brooklyn Fox for his springtime review in 1962. Actually, we weren't exactly on the bill. Uh, the little girls was such and such and such and such and them. Mm -hmm. The girls was and them. Murray also used us as background singers for all the acts that couldn't sing real well. It was during these shows that the Ronettes image was really born. My mother always told us to look for a gimmick that would make us stand out from all the other groups. Something that made us different. Ooh. Y'all, we was talking about Jonathan Majors the other day. You sexy thing, you. If Jonathan Majors had some roses hanging out of parts of his body, okay? That that motherfucker better be lucky that I am a 52-year-old uh, woman married to a woman. It was during these shows that the Ronettes image was really born. My mother always told us to look for a gimmick that would make us stand out from all the other groups. Something that made us different. Well, being half-breeds, we were born different. So we figured the thing that set us apart from the other groups were our look. And sitting around for hours on end in our dressing room at the Brooklyn Fox, we had plenty of time to work on our look. And this, when they were sitting around, is when they decided to do the cat eye thing. We'd all lay mascara on until our eyelashes were out to here. Then Nadra would grab a rat tail comb and run to the mirror shouting, let's tease our hair. We'd look pretty wild by the time we got on stage and the kids loved it. If we copied anything, it was the look of the girls we'd see on the streets of Spanish Harlem. We may have looked like street girls, but I think the audience could tell that under all that makeup, we were really just three innocent teenagers. So when the audience started responding to our street look, we played along. At our first engagement at the Brooklyn Fox, Murray could see our popularity growing. I mean, to have no hit records and still have kids waiting backstage to tear our clothes off made it pretty obvious that we had something special. That's when Murray started using us on his radio show every night. 
We'd leave school every day and go straight to his studio in the W.I.N.S. building on 57th Street. He'd tape us doing little promos and sketches that he would scatter through his show. He'd introduce us as his dancing girls and we'd go, ooh, Mary, ah, Mary. Or he'd have us in the little sketch where we'd play giggling teenagers at the beach. The idea was always that we were these sexy little things and he used at least one of these bits every night. It was corny stuff, but it was cute then. It was such a bummer to go back to high school after doing the Brooklyn Fox. Most of the kids at George Washington High did their homework to Murray the case, so they all knew we were the girls who did the comedy bits on his show. Of course, we loved all the attention it brought us, but there was another side to it. Before all of this, I'd been Veronica, the cheerleader. I was popular, and kids would say hi, and that would be that. After I got famous, the kids still said hello, but it was a different kind of hello. It didn't have any realness in it. They might as well have been saying, oh, there she is, the radio star. Why should I go to school, I asked my mother. I'm going to be a star. You're never a star without a high school diploma, she preached. That's all I heard my whole last year of school. I ended up going to summer school to make up for the classes I was failing, and I finally did get my diploma in the middle of the next term in February 1962. Now I told y'all <laughs> that Nabrob almost didn't graduate high school. And I had to get my beautiful mother to come down to the high school and talk to them men and tell them men, uh, look, what we got to do to get my daughter to graduate? I know she fucked up the entire year, okay? But, you know, I'm sure she can do it, you know. Nay, can you do it? Yeah, I can do it. But I didn't tell y'all that the 10th grade year I stayed back. My mother was like, what the hell? Like, my, I don't know. You took me from Michigan Park and brought me into the hood. It's more things important going on in my life than worried about school. My mother was like, uh, so you know you didn't put me in a bind because who's going to watch your sister while you go to summer school? Okay, because I had to go to summer school. She was pissed at me. She was like, how the fuck do you fail physical ed, Nay? All you got to do is just change. Well, first of all, I don't understand why PE is my first class. You want me to go to PE and stank up myself, changing them, take a shower in the school, put my clothes back on. Come on, ma, you asking me to do too much. I'm not about to be uh, having gym for first period. I gotta be fly at school. My ambitions in the 80s was to be a fly Betty and I can't be a fly Betty stanking all day. Cause I'm not about to get no shower in high school. That's not gonna happen, mammy. So I skipped PE every day. Okay, cause I didn't wanna do it. I failed my algebra class just because I could not do it. I told y'all I had to learn a certain kind of way and I was not able to do that it. That year, during the summer, I took PE. Did very well, I had a lot of fun. Maybe because I didn't have the pressures of them regular ninjas there. And then I was dead and this girl was like, um, I stayed back this year, I gotta go to take algebra later on at nighttime down at Armstrong. I was like, what? So you doing PE during the day? And then, and that shit was for four hours a day, y'all. And then you got to turn around and you're going to take algebra at night too? She said, if I don't, I won't pass to the 11th grade. Went home, told my mother. My mother is a Pisces. Happy birthday, mommy. Okay? Pisces make all your dreams come true. They support all your bullshit. Yeah, I went home and told my mother. I was like, mommy, look. There's an opportunity for me to be able to pass to the 11th grade. But... I need to go to school at night also. She's like, nay, you put me in the bond again. Who gonna watch your sister at night? I don't know. I don't know. But my Aunt Crystal lived on the other side of Morton Street, so my sister went down there all day, okay? I told y'all everything was about babysitting my little sister, right? But she was like, okay, education is always first, okay? She didn't want me to stay back despite me putting her in a bind with who was going to watch my sister. So I ended up going to PE from, I think it was from 8 to 12, go home, get my little sister from across the street, round Moore Street, round 640, bring her, feed her, help her, whatever it is I needed to help her with. And then by 3 o'clock, she was back 
across the street with my Aunt Crystal, and then I had to go down to Armstrong on a bus from four to eight. I passed that year, y'all. Listen, if I say I'ma do it, bitch, and I'm in control of it, oh, it's gonna be done. We spent most of 1962 waiting for one of our records to hit. It was a long wait. After What's So Sweet About Sweet 16 flopped on Coplex, Stu Phillips put our next two records out on May Records, in which was Coplex Rhythm and Blues label. But it didn't seem to matter what label they were on. Nobody was buying our records. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead didn't sell any better than our first single. We couldn't figure out why our stuff wasn't selling, but listening to those songs today, I can see why. Thank God for the Brooklyn Fox. Hit or no hit, the audience made us feel like stars. And by now, Murray booked us on every show he did at the Fox. But money was never the big thing anyway. We would have done those shows for free if only for the chance to be around all those stars. The Shangri-Las, Marvin Gaye, The Miracles, The Supremes, Martha and the Vandellas, The Contours, The Temptations, The Searchers, Jay and the Americans, The Dovells, Little Anthony and the Imperials, and The New Beats. Of course, we didn't get along with everybody. I couldn't stand the Shirelles when we were just starting out. They were headliners, and they didn't want to have anything to do with the other groups. Boy, they were stuck up. Uh, pause. How the hell is they stuck up when they're around there in the sex labyrinth with the uh, Etta James? Do y'all remember when we read the Etta James book, Etta James was told to babysit the girls for a while, okay? Bo Dirk Diggly, Diggity, Diddly, and Little Richard had invited her to this party. She was like, okay, I got the Shirelles. I'm the chaperone for the girls. You know, if anything is too much for the girls, we'll just get out of there. When Etta James got there with the Shirelles, she found out that it was an old sex labyrinth. You go through this door. It's two ladies. You go through that door. It's two men. You go through this door. It's a dog and a cat. You go through this door. It's ah, ah, ah. And the Shirelles is right there. At a James trying to cover their eyes, the little girls is like, what the fuck is happening here? At a James was so, like, taken aback by what was going on because her girlfriend was there or her friend girl was there. Okay, and she like, friend girl, what the fuck are you doing here? Girl, Etta, the same thing I'm always doing. You know what's up, Etta. But anyway, how's your daddy doing? Tell him I said hi. Shirelles, Ooh. in the meantime, then got missing and finished going on an escapade through the sex labyrinth. So I'm like, what, girl? This Shirelles, stop it, girl. If Shirelles got a book, y'all, send me the book to the P.O. box, okay? Because we need to know. It, but if they but if they not telling the truth about it, keep that shit. I don't want it. I can't stand when people write a book and then they just be like, oh, I'm so magical. Oh, everything about me is perfect. Boy, they were stuck up. The Shirelles were the only girl group with their own valet. I mean, to have a valet, you had to be superstars. And they sure thought they were. These girls would not even come out of the dressing room until they were ready to go on stage because they was busy struggling with the sex demon inside of them, girl. They was busy. Okay, they probably had to, uh, you know, quash their desires with themselves before they got on stage, girl. Don't let them Shirelles fool you, girl. That's why I love the Etta James. Ooh, that Etta James exposed everybody's bullshit. These girls would not even come out of their dressing room until they were ready to go on stage. And then they hardly spoke to you. They just walked straight out on stage. Dusty Springfield was another one I'll never forget. She shared a dressing room with us once, and I never saw anyone get so frustrated backstage. She hated being stuck back there all day and all night, and she expressed her frustration by throwing dishes. She would leave the frigging dressing room, y'all. Go out in the hallway and throw shit. What? And they allowed her to do that? But you know, the Dusty Springfield had issues. I didn't know who she was at first. Then I did a little research and come to find out she was the Tina Marie of the 60s. I'll accept that. And on top of that, y'all, the lady was going through issues because 
well, she had mental issues, period, but she was always struggling with knowing that at any time, if her real sexuality, because she was a lesbian, she was a closeted lesbian, was to be exposed to the public, would they accept her? Would her career be over because she's sucking on a vagina and not a pig? I mean, come on. I've had plenty of jobs where I did not expose my sexuality. And it, was, and it was crazy because it was such a big deal. Like, people would literally hold that against you when you like the same sex, you know? And then to make it so bad, they would just say little dumb stuff. That's not being there with her because she might try and hunch us. What? What you think? I'm a, 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 a graper? You think I grape women? That's what you think? What makes you think that I want your ass? Your pineapple skin ass. Don't nobody want you, but that's how ignorant straight people can be sometimes, especially during those days, child. The people just don't think that the gays have any form of preference, that if you're a man, every man you meet, you want to fuck. If you're a woman, every woman you meet, you want to suck. That's just how it works. It's not right, but, you know, that's the ignorance of it all. You know, like, I don't have no preference. This girl was so ignorant that she thought that because I was cool with her friend that I wanted to fuck her friend. No, I'm not going to fuck your friend. I don't want your friend. Look at her. She's filthy. What are you talking about? She got on yoga pants and no socks and ashy feet. Why would you think that I would want her? You know what I'm saying? So it was just... Uh, you know, it's, it's insulting to us to think that just because you a female, we want you. Half the time, we would never. I know I wouldn't. I know it's other dirty, filthy little girls out there that probably would sleep with that girl, but not me. That's not my preference. At any rate, getting back to Dusty Springfield, I just don't want to be in the same dressing room with a bitch that goes out, break every dish, and then come back in like, hey, what's popping? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. That's not, No. No, I don't want to be in a room with the crazy bitch. The toughest part about being around all of these stars was that we knew we really weren't one of them. For a singer, having the right producer is like an actor having the right director. A good producer knows how to use your voice and how to get it on record. He has to be able to write songs that work for your sound or else be smart enough to choose ones that do. For us, Stu Phillips was none of these things. So at the start of 1963, our New Year's resolution was to get a new producer. And we set our sights high. For our producer, we were going to get Phil Spector.